Uh, I mean, good afternoon, and uh, thank you for the invitation. Uh, I mean, uh, and thank you for I mean organizing this very nice uh, meeting. Um, so yes, today I would like to uh, talk about projects we are currently running in the lab, and that um, aim at understanding how uh, skin cells uh, communicate, and especially how skin cells uh, understand each other. And uh, I mean, when you are looking just to this um, live cell uh, uh, movie, you can see that uh, it's made of primary human melanocytes and keratinocytes. And clearly, we can see that they, they, they try to touch each other, to establish contact, they make projections, they are moving towards each other. So clearly, there is a kind of dialogue that is established here, and they can uh, uh, somehow uh, sense this dialogue. And um, when I'm preparing this kind of, of, of talk, it remembers me always, uh, uh, very often, I mean, uh, uh, a movie that I like a lot uh, uh, that is uh, called Lost in Translation. And uh, I think today we have to slightly change the title because it would be more uh, how to not get lost in translation and how this melanocyte and keratinocyte can uh, um, succeed in understanding each other. So this work is um, uh, uh, performed by a very talented uh, postdoc in uh, my group, Lia Dominguez, and in tight collaboration with uh, Clarence Research and Development Team. Um, so, uh, you all know, I guess, uh, that uh, in the epidemic, so the outermost layer of the skin, or at least regarding pigmentation, uh, you have uh, two main cell types, melanocyte and keratinocyte. And this uh, melanocyte uh, here is uh, really the melanin factory, so synthesizing the melanin pigment in a membrane-bound organelle called the melanosomes. And once this melanosome is fully mature, uh, uh, it will be transferred to keratinocyte uh, in order to uh, populate the epidermis and to uh, give rise to uh, skin pigmentation and photoprotection. And for instance, when uh, the skin is exposed to, uh, to UV, uh, keratinocyte gets activated. Uh, they start to uh, secrete uh, several molecules like uh, hormones, paracrine factors, as well as these extra vesic extracellular vesicles called exosomes that we heard about uh, this morning. And these factors are uh, uh, somehow able to, to uh, uh, lead to some transduction uh, of signals uh, inside the melanocyte. And one of the uh, most famous one, I would say, is uh, lead to the production of uh, cyclic uh, IMP, this second messenger, that is uh, produced by uh, the adenyl cyclase. And uh, this, uh, um, this cyclic IMP is quite interesting uh, in melanocyte because uh, it can lead to different uh, phenotypes, I would say, or it can lead to different processes, like pigmentation directly by uh, promoting uh, and the, the, the transcription of genes involved in melanin uh, synthesis and melanosome myogenesis. But in melanocyte and as in other cell types, uh, the cyclic IMP can also uh, uh, help the change in plasticity of the cells. What I mean by plasticity is it can help the formation of dendrites and also the establishment of cell contacts. And of course, uh, a cell is able to pigment and able to uh, make contact is uh, uh, likely, uh, at least in skin, uh, to promote the melanin transfer and to provide skin pigmentation. So this project aims at understanding how uh, this melanocyte can uh, uh, um, receive some, or at least understand some extracellular signals and to translate these signals into intracellular processes. So uh, when we started this project, we um, I have to say have a, a first a very naive approach. Uh, it was to, um, we decided to use human skin biopsy uh, to perform uh, electron microscopy on that tissue. Uh, in order to have a, a, a very close look uh, uh, at the ultrastructure of the uh, melanocytes keratinocyte interface. The idea behind was that um, if there is um, some molecular platform, I would say, that are able to send these uh, uh, extracellular signals and to translate these signals, it should be at this interface. So what we observe uh, first is this kind of uh, small membrane invagination here. I don't know if you see well. Uh, in blue, that is the plasma membrane of the melanocyte that is facing the plasma membrane of keratinocyte in red. 
Another view would be uh, that one. So here we are in a, a melanocyte uh, dendrite full of uh, this uh, uh, pigmented melanosome and surrounding by this keratinocyte here. And you can see these vesicles, this small plasma membrane invagination here that are decorating the plasma membrane of the melanocyte. So uh, we decided to um, have a better understanding of the morphology of this uh, structure, and for that, uh, we used uh, electron tomography. So uh, this is a, a, an imaging approach that uh, helped to, uh, that uh, allow to reconstruct in 3D at the ultrastructural level the morphology of your um, sample of interest, I would say. Uh, so here we are still in the melanocyte dendrite. The plasma membrane is in green. The uh, uh, plasma membrane of the keratinocyte is in blue. And in red, you have the melanosomes full of pigment here, and you have this plasma membrane invagination here in white. So what we can uh, see is that uh, uh, these plasma membrane invagination are still connected to the plasma membrane. Uh, the diameter range between 60 and 80 nanometer, and uh, they are non-coated. Uh, uh, what I mean by coat is like a clattering, coated, uh, a clattering coat, for instance. So uh, this is really uh, all the morphological features of one type of invagination that is called uh, caveole. Um, so the caveole uh, are these uh, schematized here, uh, these plasma membrane invagination that are composed of different set of proteins, among which uh, cavin and caveolin are uh, really crucial and uh, important, and among which the, the cavin one and the caveolin one are really uh, crucial for biogenesis and uh, function of this caveolin. Historically, they have been shown to control lipid homeostasis, like cholesterol balance, uh, signaling events like by controlling uh, activity or by inhibiting uh, 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 signaling through uh, GPCR, the G protein copper receptor, and more recently has been shown to control the um, mechanosensing of the cells, meaning that uh, this uh, uh, invagination can be seen as a, a lipid reservoir that can flatten out or being invaginated. And by providing more membrane, more lipids to the plasma membrane, this membrane can uh, uh, um, cope with the mechanical stress and to avoid mechanical rupture, for instance. So in order to, get, uh, to, to go uh, a bit further in that um, examination, I would say, uh, we decided to use synthetic skin. Uh, for the simple reason that uh, we can uh, 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 monitor, for instance, the number of caveolar profile we can see over time of formation of the skin, because I guess you know that uh, uh, after seeding the cells, at day four, the epidermis starts to stratify, day six, it starts to pigment, and day 12, it's fully stratified and pigmented. So what we did is to monitor the number of caveolar profile we uh, were observing at the two different interfaces we can um, we can uh, see, meaning that the, the uh, melanocyte keratinocyte one, so the heterologous interface, and the homologous interface that is keratinocyte facing each other. And what we can observe is that the number of uh, caviar profile is much more enriched at this heterologous interface as compared to the homologous one. What we can do also is to uh, quantify the contribution of each cell within that uh, interface. And uh, clearly, uh, both cell types uh, contribute to this caveole at their plasma membrane. But what is interesting is that over time of formation of the skin, the melanocyte is the one that will make uh, evolving this number of caveole, with a peak at day six where the uh, skin starts to pigment. So uh, to ease a bit our um, project, we decided to uh, use a more simple system and to go uh, in a 2D co-culture system. So what we did here is to use primary human melanocyte and keratinocyte, and we immunostain uh, using antibody uh, targeting caveolin 1 or cavin 1. So this is uh, uh, this uh, white spot you can see here. And what you see is this linear pattern here at the uh, plasma membrane of melanocyte that is facing the keratinocyte. So recapitulating somehow what we have observed uh, uh, in tissue. We can quantify this, and indeed, we have much more uh, uh, enrichment of this caveolar number at this plasma membrane of the melanocyte that is facing the keratinocyte. So since uh, uh, um, 
uh, keratinocyte uh, can secrete many factors and clearly have a, a, a very important role in controlling the, the physiology of the melanocyte. We decided to test whether a keratinocyte might have a role in this uh, uh, amount of cavities that are produced. So we use this co-culture system, but we also grow melanocyte alone or together with an irrelevant cells like HeLa cells, for instance. And what you can see here is this kind of polarization and intensity profile. And clearly, when melanocytes are grown together with keratinocyte, this uh, uh, enrichment and polarization of cavity is much more increased or at least maintained. So since keratinocyte secret factor, we also uh, decided to uh, test whether the secreted factor might have a role. And for that, we grow melanocyte in conditional media, uh, keratinocyte conditional media. And here again, we observe an increase in this cavioli polarization. So meaning that together that uh, the keratinocyte can secrete factor and somehow these factors can tell to the melanocyte, okay, you have to keep, you have to maintain your cavioli. So uh, since the melanocyte can also be stimulated by other means, like for instance, uh, UVB, we decided to uh, um, stimulate melanocyte by low doses of UVB. And here we monitor the expression level of uh, all the cavioli associated proteins. And they are all, uh, their expression is uh, increased over time, meaning very likely that the uh, uh, cavioli are much more formed and maintained at the level of melanocytes. So together, melanocytes need, uh, can, can be stimulated, UV or keratinocyte, and this stimulation can maintain cavioli. So the question now is, what would be the role of this cavioli during pigmentation, for instance? So for that, we uh, use uh, sRNA to deplete uh, the expression of cavolin 1 and cavolin 1. If cavolin 1 is not there, cavioli are not formed and not functional. And what we can observe quickly is that the expression level of tyrosine A, so uh, the, one of the key enzymes for uh, melanin production, is increased. Uh, this is associated with an increase in the uh, production of pigment by the melanocyte and also associated with uh, more numerous uh, uh, pigmented melanosome we can observe in cells. So together showing that uh, cavioli are here to somehow restrict or slightly downregulate pigmentation in melanocyte. So the question is how cavioli can do, put on, uh, can do that. So we decided to have a first look on the possible signaling events that would be under the control of cavioli. Um, I remember you that oh, indeed this keratinocyte can secrete factors. These factors, they can find their own receptor at the plasma membrane of the melanocyte, and this will lead to uh, activation of a signaling pathway, like activation of adenyl cyclase that will lead to cyclic AMP production and lately pigmentation. So it has been shown in other cell types that uh, uh, caveolin 1 uh, can interact with adenylcyclase and inhibit its activity. So we tested the hypothesis whether caveoli might negatively control uh, the cyclic AMP uh, production in melanocyte. For that, we uh, use phoscoline uh, to uh, directly activate adenylcyclase, but by bypassing the need of uh, having a, a receptor. So uh, when we monitor the uh, amount of uh, cyclic AMP that is produced, so in control cells we observe upon phoscoline treatment a fourfold increase that is double when cavolin 1 is uh, absent, so when cavoli are not formed. Showing you again here that cavoli can negatively regulate the cyclic AMP production in melanocyte. Um, so we are, we are here. Uh, where cavioli can be somehow controlled by the keratinocyte and by um, stimulation of the melanocyte. And uh, cavioli can also control uh, signal transduction pathway like cyclic AMP production and pigmentation. So the obvious question for us is to test whether uh, cavioli might have also a role on the cell uh, plasticity. So uh, our first approach was to uh, grow melanocyte in different type of uh, medium. Uh, the first medium is a, what we call a, a, a poor medium, meaning a medium where you have uh, no factors that are susceptible to, to, to stimulate the melanocyte. What we can observe is that uh, in control or depleted cavalin 1 condition, that uh, they are um, kind of elongated and almost indistinguishable from each other. 
When we grow them in a rich media, meaning that we add some factors, like for instance uh, endothelin one, I would say, uh, uh, the controlled melanocytes start to make some projection to adapt uh, to adopt a star shape like, while the caveolin one depleted melanocyte is much more elongated and stretched, and this is exactly the same when uh, uh, melanocytes are grown in poor media but supplemented with phosphorylene. So here it shows that indeed cavoli can have a role on the cell uh, shape and plasticity, and that this is likely under the control of cyclic AMP production because phosphorylene is not inducing any change here. So we uh, uh, monitor a bit uh, more, uh, at least we, we decide to, to quantify a bit more this, uh, this uh, observation. What we did first is to uh, quantify what we uh, call the aspect ratio, meaning that this is uh, the ratio between the, the, the major axis of the cell and the minor axis. And what you can see is that you have a, a, an increase uh, of this ratio uh, when cavolin one is not present in rich media or uh, media supplemented with phosphorine. So meaning that indeed, they are much more elongated and stretched. Another uh, thing that we uh, measure is the number of extension these um, melanocytes are doing. And when cavolin one is depleted, uh, and the cells are kind of uh, stimulated, we are not able to promote uh, uh, several uh, extensions, more or less they are bipolar and looks like the control cells in poor media. So together showing that cavoli can have a role and have an impact on the melanocyte dendricity through likely cyclic AMP production. So the thing is now, okay, uh, they have a, bit, a different shape. So uh, we decided to test whether uh, cells can, um, this melanocyte uh, can still interact with keratinocyte. Uh, so for that, we uh, decided to use live cell imaging uh, in a co-culture setup. So primary human melanocyte and keratinocyte uh, together, but melanocyte depleted or not for caveolin one. And here you have the, the, the control melanocyte that can uh, uh, makes projection that is very dynamic, that can also uh, uh, establish some contact with keratinocyte. And here, the cavolin one depleted melanocyte that is elongated, stretched, polydynamic, and established very few contact with uh, the keratinocyte. So we quantified this by uh, measuring the uh, number of keratinocytes that are able to establish long-lasting uh, 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 contact with keratinocyte, long-lasting meaning at least more than one hour in our condition. And we observe a, 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 a dramatic drop here uh, of uh, this uh, number of contact, likely uh, showing that uh, this cavity can stabilize this uh, melanocyte keratinocyte contact. So together, uh, we are here, so we know that cavioli are uh, polarized uh, uh, at the melanocyte in front of the keratinocyte, that it can control signaling pathway, pigmentation, uh, plasticity, cell contact. So the obvious readout after that is to test um, uh, the transfer, the melanin uh, transfer in uh, our condition. So the first thing we did is to use our co-culture uh, setup. Uh, we immunostain uh, melanin using antibodies that recognize uh, the amyloid fibrils onto which the melanin is deposited. And we quantify the number of keratinocytes positive for pigment and uh, uh, when they are positive, how much pigment they have. Uh, and these two parameters are uh, decreased when cavolin 1 is depleted uh, from melanocyte, uh, suggesting that cavoli can contribute to melanin transfer in vitro. So, then, uh, what I told you also is that uh, uh, keratinocyte can somehow uh, uh, control uh, uh, and enhance the, the amount of cavioli at the surface of uh, melanocyte. So what we also decided to test is whether keratinocyte can do the opposite, meaning don't regulate uh, cavioli. So uh, for that, we came back in uh, one of uh, our previous studies uh, a few years ago, where we showed that uh, keratinocyte secre exosome secreted by keratinocyte, so this extracellular vesicle secreted by keratinocyte, can indeed modulate uh, melanocyte pigmentation. So as you heard this morning, these exosomes are loaded with proteins, with lipid, as well as miRNA. And what we identified, uh, at least in uh, that study, that one miRNA was loaded in that exosome was able to modulate pigmentation of the melanocyte. And interestingly, the same year, the group of uh, Lionel Larue 
showed that uh, that particular mRNA was able to target Kavolin uh, uh, 1 in uh, melanoma cell. So what we decided to test is whether that mRNA can also have a, 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 a role uh, through, Kavioli, through Kaviolin on the transfer of pigment. So this mRNA is called uh, 203A. We express it in melanocyte. Indeed, the Kaviolin 1 is downregulated. And as a consequence, we observe that the tyrosinase is increased, as we showed, for instance, in the sRNA uh, uh, condition. And uh, also, uh, using this co-culture setup, we observe a drop in the amount of pigment that is transferred from melanocytes to keratinocyte. So here, showing that if um, indeed the cavoli can contribute to melanin transfer, and potentially the keratinocyte might be able to also control that event. So now the thing is that, okay, we are in 2D, so uh, we would like to possibly uh, test whether what I'm, I'm telling you is also true uh, in 3D. So for that, uh, we um, had the chance to uh, collaborate uh, with uh, Clarence and to have uh, Nathalie André, who is in the audience today, uh, who has a know-how, uh, I mean, how to generate this uh, synthetic skin. So what she did uh, is to use primary human keratinocytes together with controlled melanocyte or caviolin one depleted melanocyte. And then uh, we, decided, we decided to um, uh, um, analyze this uh, tissue at the uh, electron microscopy level. So here we are in the uh, control epidemic. You have a melanocyte control here, uh, full of black uh, pigment, and the neighboring keratinocytes here are also pigmented, illustrating that the transfer has occurred. Uh, at some occasion, we can also observe uh, uh, this uh, naked pigment here that is likely secreted by the melanocyte and ready to be uptaken, uh, to be up we uptaken by uh, the keratinocyte. So then, when we go in the Kavolin 1 depleted um, uh, epidermis, this melanocyte is still pigmented, but this is coherent with what we showed uh, uh, in vitro, in 2D. However, the neighboring keratinocytes here are devoid of any pigment. So we quantify this observation and did observe a decrease in the number of uh, keratinocytes that are positive for pigment, and once they are positive, they have less pigment uh, in their cytosol. So showing that Kevoli contributes also to melanin transfer in 3D and in synthetic skin. So uh, now we'd like to conclude and try to um, leave you with this kind of uh, idea um, that uh, Kaveole uh, uh, is able somehow to organize spatially the melanocyte. I mean, to tell the melanocyte uh, what to do uh, and where. Uh, because indeed, Kaveole are uh, polarized in some area of the plasma membrane of the melanocyte meaning that some area are kind of devoid of, of cavioli. So if we speculate a bit, uh, we can imagine that some uh, signal transduction might be more, um, uh, uh, more activated in some area of the cells or more downregulated in some others. And the same would be true for this uh, dendrites and plasma membrane uh, plasticity. So I think it's really important for polarizing uh, the melanocyte. And on top of that, the keratinocyte is able to control uh, these, uh, uh, these features, either positively or negatively. And uh, I don't think it's a pure on and off uh, system. I would like just to, to leave you with the idea that I guess it's a slightly on, slightly off process and that the fine-tuning of this amount of cavioli or the fine-tuning or where you will position this cavioli will be likely important for the overall pigmentation of the tissue. Um, so with that, I would like to um, thank, I mean, uh, all the people working in, in my group, especially Lilia Dominguez, who uh, performed that work, uh, the team of Grassa Raposo, uh, in which I'm uh, working on, uh, Issue Urbain, Maris Romao, Xavier Gachin, and Florent Pincin, who uh, perform a lot of work on the electron microscopy. 
Uh, I would like to thank the group of Christophe Lamas at the Institut Curie, who is an expert in Caveole. So it's really helpful because I, I'm not at all an expert in Caveole. And uh, also, I would like to warmly thank the research and development, deal, uh, development uh, team of Clarin, so Catelvier, Christelle Guéret, and uh, obviously uh, Nathalie André. The imaging facility at Institut Curie, our funding, and uh, you for your attention. So thank you so much. Thank you very, very much, Cédric, for this very nice presentation. So the discussion is now open. Do you have some question in the audience? Yes, Marek. Just at the front. Um, thank you very much. I, 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 I always look forward to your speeches because it's so clear-cut and well illustrated. Uh, now, uh, Electron microscopy is a fine approach, but you have to be lucky to spot the right moments uh, uh, that happen in the skin. Uh, it's, however, somehow puzzling that uh, so rare are the pictures when you can see really the, the pigment transfer. You show some uh, melanosomes outside of the cells, but um, the intermediate uh, steps are uh, very rare, uh, anyhow, rarely observed. Uh, do you have any idea why? Um, but because I, I can just give you my guess. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, but it's true that it's very rare. Um, it's slightly, we, we can observe slightly more often in synthetic skin, I have to say, that in human skin biopsies, for instance. So, my opinion is that um, the intercellular space between the melanocyte and keratinocyte is very narrow. And uh, I have this, um, fine. the keratinocyte is known to be um, almost kind of a phagocytic cells. So I really believe that once a pigment is outside, it is very rapidly uh, eaten by uh, uh, the, the, the keratinocyte. At least what we observe uh, in vitro, because we have also another project on that, uh, clearly when you feed a uh, keratinocyte with pigment, very rapidly uh, the pigment is inside. So in skin, of course, I don't know. Uh, the thing is that also, also in skin, you are in a kind of steady state situation. It would be, I would say, maybe better to potentially uh, do some electron microscopy on skin that have been uh, just exposed to UV. Uh, well, I mean, this is doable. Uh, we didn't do it, but this is doable. But, but I really think this is the, that, because there is so, much, so, so few space in between the two cells that once it's there, it is just a uh, catch. <laughs> so, well, and how there is no direct transfer of pigment, apparently, from cell to cell. It, first, uh, there is an uh, intermediate step of secreting uh, melanosomes into extracellular uh, spaces, apparently. But, so there is many uh, different uh, hypotheses that has been um, published in the literature. The only thing I can say uh, is that in our hands, uh, when we are manipulating either uh, human skin biopsies or uh, human skin synthetic skin, the only event we observe is secretion. I never observe like uh, the nanotubes, I never observe like uh, phagocytosis of a dendrite or whatever. So it's not because I don't see that it's not existing, but uh, based on what uh, I have observed, I would say that the, in human skin, the major process sh should be, in my opinion, the secretion. Yes, it's a quick question. Oh. Okay, uh, perhaps it is a naive question because I, I do not know uh, much uh, about that. But uh, is the part of the membrane in the mineral in the site which is enriched in uh, caveole, is it uh, similar to uh, lipid draft? I mean enriched in uh, sphingomyelin cholesterol receptor. And, and also, is, is it the part uh, of the membrane where the melanosome can go out of the cell? 
Uh, naive, but very good question, I have to say. Uh, so, uh, caveoli are known to be enriched in cholesterol. So, uh, even if we didn't uh, check carefully, I have to say, uh, it's m most likely to be the case. Uh, regarding the um, secretion part, um, I don't have clear answer where, because we, we tried to, to have a look to that. Uh, the thing is that, um, when cavalier are present, at least, the, the, the area where cavalier are, are not the area of the plasma moment that will be uh, uh, the, the, the one that will make this done right, for instance, this protrusion. So this part is more rigid. So my feeling is that uh, if secretion occurs somewhere, it should be on the other part. Uh, I have no real clear evidence for that, uh, because it's almost impossible to follow the secretion uh, uh, in vitro like this, but this is my guess. The other coin. <laughs> Cédric, do you have any details um, on some potential uh, encore prote uh, protein encore to the caveola that could and eventually the receptor on, keratin on keratinocytes that would uh, be involved in the stabilization between uh, in the dialogue between melanos melanocyte and keratinocyte and that would contribute to the transfer of melanosomes. Um, I, if I had the answer, I would have presented, you know. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but, uh, uh, no, uh, so the caveolae are known to be encored to the actin cytoskeleton. So, uh, and we really believe that uh, uh, the way it is encored to the cytoskeleton or how it can possibly remodel the cytoskeleton would explain some of the phenotypes we are regarding the cell plasticity. Regarding the receptor, we have absolutely no idea. Um, what is known in other cell system is that uh, several uh, J-protein copper receptors are uh, uh, found in caveolae. It's still not clear whether uh, they are there to be inhibited or to be activated. So uh, again, my guess would be that, um, I don't know, uh, endotelin receptors, uh, MC1R, this kind of guy uh, should be somehow found close nearby or within the caveolae. Uh, to be uh, able to regulate uh, the activity. So we tried a bit in that direction, but um, not too strong. So I cannot tell you more than that. Is there any last question? Yes, Frédéric. Uh, you mentioned an article of uh, Lionel Larue on P10, and uh, because in patients with P10, with germline p mutation like uh, Cowden disease, you have uh, uh, l'antigen in uh, buccal area and in, gen in genitals, and you also have an increase of melanoma. So I was wondering if the um, abnormality of pigmentation in this disease is related to, uh, to caveolin, and if P10 is located in the membrane of caveolin. Uh. Uh, the short answer would be, I don't know. Um, but the thing is that Cavoli have been shown, uh, there is many, many studies about that, uh, to be either a tumor suppressor or a pro-tumorogenic factor. So I think it really depends on what are the downstream effectors. It, it, uh, it can be very different from cell to cells or depending on the context. So, to be honest, I don't know. Uh, regarding where is P10, uh, I have absolutely no idea. Because I normally know. it's just under the membrane, it can, in contact well, to a uh, phosphate adenosyl three uh, phosphate, and so, so the location is just under the membrane, and uh, but I don't know if there is an enrichment in special area like caveolin. I don't know either, but he, he, if there is any link between association to membrane that would be a kind of uh, enrich for cholesterol, thangomelin, and all these things, he, it would be very likely. But to be honest, I don't know. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. So we have to uh, move to the second speaker. I'm very uh, happy uh, to welcome the Professor Kenji Kabashima 
from the Department of Dermatology uh, Graduate School of Medicine in uh, Kyoto, Japan. Uh, Dr. Kabashima is a world-recognized uh, expert in the field of skin immunology. He's going to present us an overview of the communication between immune and non-immune cells in the skin. So thank you very much, Dr. Professor Kabashima, for coming from so far, and uh, please for your presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jerome, for kind of introduction. And I would also like to appreciate uh, the organizers, Marek and also Joe, for inviting me to this wonderful meeting. I agree, this meeting is like a Gordon conference. I accept Spain meeting serves uh, wine during lunchtime. <laughs> I enjoyed. <laughs> so I'm from uh, Kyoto, and uh, actually uh, uh, this year, uh, one of my mentor got a Nobel Prize in Kyoto, from Kyoto. And uh, he's a master of uh, golf, so I learned golf from him. I got a uh, uh, wine after I became a professor. And one of my, another uh, important colleague is uh, Shinya Yamanaka in Kyoto University, who discovered IPS. And he's a nice buddy uh, of running. We run together uh, at least once a month. And because of that, uh, I run uh, around three hours still. So I, this morning, I run uh, through BC. This is really beautiful. I really appreciate inviting me here. So uh, I will talk about science. So uh, I'm interested in skin biology, especially uh, cutaneous immune responses. But today I'd like to uh, talk about the interaction between immune cells and other uh, components of the skin. And to address this question, I would like to see inside the skin. And to evaluate the inside skin, of course we use sometimes ultrasound, and that is uh, useful. But to be more precise, uh, we use two photo microscope. And this is a good fluorescence microscope to visualize inside the skin. So because of that, we can uh, image the skin uh, 3D. So um, because of that, uh, we can see the keratinocyte uh, proliferation uh, like this and this and this in vivo. And we also can see sebaceous glands and sweat glands here. And also we can visualize blood vessels, uh, lymphatic vessels, and we can see closely lymphatic vessels, and we can also see the interaction, um, distribution of uh, blood vessels and red lymphatic vessels uh, in non-invasive manner. And we can visualize Langerhans cells. And this is uh, Langerhans cells under the steady state, very steady. And during the contact dermatitis, uh, during the, uh, this is uh, actually um, still the steady state. And in the deeper area, Langerhans cells, some of them are slowly migrating. And in the deep dermis, this is a lymphatic vessels, and you can see Langerhans cells in the lymphatic vessels. These Langerhans cells are migrating from the skin to draining lymph nodes. And we can visualize uh, collagen fibers as a blue color. And this is human skin sample. We can visualize uh, blue uh, collagen fibers and green elastic fibers. And we can quantitate the amount of elastic fibers in a safe manner. So uh, this is my idol when she was 18, and now she's 40, so she looks a bit different. And when we took biopsy samples from young and old people, and then the clear difference of uh, elastic uh, fiber distribution, and we can quantitate how old our, your skin aging is. And we can also visualize skin cancer cells in a single level. Uh, this small 
red point you can see uh, is a single level cancer. So we may uh, take advantage of this uh, technique to make a surgical margin. And we can also visualize a um, um, signaling pathway. For example, MAP arc kinase signal is activated. The skin, uh, the cells color change from green to red. So uh, as you can see, uh, white blood vessels, when transmigrate from uh, blood vessels into the skin, they use um, MAP kinase signaling. And we can also visualize uh, peripheral nerves. Probably tomorrow um, uh, there is another good session, but we can see um, peripheral nerves distributed in the epidermis. And in the acute phase of atopic dermatitis, in using mouse models, distribution of uh, peripheral nerves has changed compared to untreated site. And one of the uh, key factors to regulate peripheral nerve distribution in the skin is IL-31, which is reported by uh, Bernhard Homes group in Germany. And also, there are several papers suggesting that IL-31 may act on peripheral nerves to induce itch. So we started uh, making IL-31 neutralizing antibody about 10 years ago with Japanese small company, Chugai. And right now we uh, report, uh, reported anti-IL-31 receptor uh, may be uh, useful uh, to control uh, atopic dermatitis itch. So this is a result of uh, phase two clinical trial. And compared to placebo, uh, anti-IL-31 reduced uh, each sensation. And uh, also uh, improved the uh, uh, skin uh, sleep onset latency. So, and also uh, Im improved the total sleep time. So uh, control each may uh, increase the quality of life of atopic dermatitis patients. And this drug acts on each at first, but few weeks later, uh, the skin regions uh, gets better. So after uh, 52 weeks, and then the uh, clinical manifestations gets better. So um, my message from this experiment is immune cells uh, produce IL-31, which acts on peripheral nerves to induce uh, eczematous uh, conditions of the skin. So interaction between uh, immune cells and peripheral nerves may be important for the development of atopic dermatitis. And I would like to move on to the second topic, which is a, a possible role of uh, skin as a peripheral uh, tertiary immune organs. As you know, in the gut, uh, pyre patches exist, and which is called gut-associated lymphoid tissue. But in the skin, we don't detect any uh, lymphoid tissues under the steady state. And then how immune responses are modulated in the skin? That is my question. And to address this question, we use contact dermatitis model. Uh, you may see this patient, and I hope you can guess which induces contact dermatitis. That is not easy. Uh, in Japan, we play Go, and red, uh, black line uh, is we use lacquer to use a black line. So uh, this is patient is a contact dermatitis to lacquer. And when we look at the contact dermatitis sites uh, closely, and then we can see small red papules accumulating around contact dermatitis area, suggesting that uh, there seems to be a certain location where memory T cells are activated in the skin. So to visualize uh, what is going on inside the skin during contact dermatitis, we use a mouse contact dermatitis model. We put the hapten on the abdomen, and then after application, hapten after hapten application, we put the same hapten on the ear to induce contact dermatitis. 
Uh, in contrast to atopic dermatitis induced by protein antigen, protein antigen is large, so that's why uh, usually protein antigen can stuck at the stratum corneum area, but happening is very small, so that can easily penetrate into the dermis, as you can see on, on the uh, green label. So there are two types of antigen-presenting cells in the skin. One is epidermal Langerhans cells, the other one is dermal dendritic cells. And uh, because of the time limitation, uh, I don't want to go into detail, but during contact dermatitis, dermal dendritic cells play important role. So we visualize contact dermatitis uh, and visualize the dermal area. So to visualize the cute skin dendritic cells and memory T cells, we um, put the haptan on the abdomen for sensitization, and after sensitization, we collected memory T cells and uh, label as, as red, and then transfer into uh, CD11C YFP mouse, where uh, dendritic cells are labeled as green. And then we put the same haptan to the ear to induce contact dermatitis. And we visualize 24 hours from the beginning to induce contact dermatitis. So that's why it's not easy experiment, although uh, my colleague Yohei is a good marathon runner also, but 24 hour experiment, he always <laughs> like that. <laughs> and so um, we, green is dendritic cells, and then memory T cells in the blood is start to accumulate after uh, contact dermatitis, uh, elicitation. So first, dermal dendritic cells distributed quite evenly, and then these dendritic cells start to accumulate at a certain area, and then memory T cells comes from blood vessels into the skin, and then these memory T cells are also accumulated at cutaneous dendritic cell cluster area. And therein, uh, dermal dendritic cells and red memory T cells seems to interact, and some of the memory T cells are activated, and they even uh, proliferate in the skin. And then they produce interferon gamma over there. So in the steady state, dermal dendritic cells distributed evenly, but after, during contact dermatitis, they start to accumulate. So we call this uh, structure inducible skin-associated lymphoid tissue, isolate. And isolate is formed at, this is a capillary, and then this is a post-capillary venules. So green dendritic cells accumulate at post-capillary venules. And um, I don't want to go into detail, but uh, around the post-capillary venules, there's, there exists macrophages, and macrophages um, collect, accumulate uh, dermal dendritic cells, and peripheral macrophages act on blood vessels to collect uh, memory T cells from the skin to draining skin from the blood vessels into the skin. And then that's why uh, memory T cells and me uh, dermal dendritic cells can meet very efficiently. And just above this DCT cell cluster, uh, this is a red one, is a um, peri uh, keratinocyte, suggesting uh, epidermal edema occurs just above the isolate area. So this is an isolate area, isolate area, and then you can see very strong epidermal spongiosis uh, exists even in, this is a human uh, contact dermatitis. So post-capillary venules is a very specific site where uh, memory T cells and dermal dendritic cells uh, accumulate at, the point, at this area. So uh, post-capillary venules is a very uh, important site. And this story is also applicable to other peripheral organs, including lung. So during a, uh, influenza virus infection, uh, IBART is formed around uh, post-capillary venules. And post-capillary uh, 
uh, eye salt is formed not only during contact dermatitis, but also BCG uh, injection into the skin can also induce eye salt formation. But this is not only the case, because uh, neutrophils seems to accumulate during imiki mode uh, injection. As you can see, during imiki mode uh, injection, which can mimic the psoriasis model, you can see this is a blue, black one is hair follicle, so you can see around the hair follicles, neutrophils seems to accumulate. And also, during the tape stripping or scratching behavior, uh, hair follicles produce chemokines to attract uh, dendritic cells. So uh, I think it depends on the, it is a kind, a kind of context dependent manner. And also, uh, we know that during the contact dermatitis, we see eye salt, but also we see dendritic cells and the CD3 positive T cells around uh, epidermal area, epidermal um, dermal junctions. And when we took a uh, live imaging of the skin at the epidermal area in the later phase of contact dermatitis, we can see green Langerhans cells and memory T cells seems to interact in the epidermis during the later phase of the stage. So three locations for cutaneous immune response seems to exist. One is uh, post-capillary venules, especially at the early phase of contact dermatitis for induction. And epidermal Langerhans cells seems to also play in the late phase of contact dermatitis and also around the hair follicle area, mechanical stress or epidermal infection or maybe initial innate immune response uh, can be induced at post uh, around hair follicles. And uh, I'll talk a little bit about my hobby. Uh, I run a uh, marathon, but also run trail running in the mountains. I joined uh, Ultra Trail du Mont Blanc last year. It is a 170 kilometer race, and up and down, and uh, it's usually running around 3,000 meter area. And so dur during the night time, and also the, around the top of the mountain, minus 10 degrees, so it's really cold, and we need to carry everything, but it's tough. And that was last year, and this year I also ran 100 miles race in Japan. It took about 28 hours, so it's a kind of crazy. And, but after uh, running marathon or trail running, not only me, but also most of my friends got uh, flu infection or herpes virus infection. So when I checked the epidemiological studies, that suggests that after high intense exercise, uh, odds ratio of infection goes up. And especially after marathon. Ma after marathon, odds ratio goes six. So which means marathon may not be good for uh, virus infection. But we don't know why. So uh, I let my uh, mice to run on the treadmill. We specially ordered treadmill for mice. And this study was done by a PhD student. He's also a runner. And, we, and also after running, uh, these mice are infected with HSV, herpes simplex virus infection. Uh, poor mice. And uh, after high intense exercise, clinical score of uh, HSV virus infection got really worse and some of them surprisingly died. And virus titer in the blood also really high, suggesting that uh, similar things can be uh, occur, similar things can occur even in mice. So the, to elucidate the mechanism of uh, immune suppression due to high intense exercise, HIE, uh, we first uh, review the mechanism, how we have antivirus immune, how, how we can induce antiviral immune responses. After uh, virus infection, there are several types. One is uh, plasma cytoid dendritic cells, which produce type 1 interferon, and this is fight against virus infection, and also this uh, type 1 interferon acts on dendritic cells, 
and leading to activation of NK cells or CD8 positive T cells to fight against infected cells. So uh, suggesting that plasma dendritic dendritic cells, which is called PDC, play an important role. So we checked the number of plasma cytoid dendritic cells in the vagina of the mice after HSV virus infection and after high intense exercise. And we found that after exercise, the number of plasma cytoid dendritic cells in the vaginal area decreased. So suggesting that PDC cannot go into the uh, virus infection site. And then why? Uh, so next we check the number of plasma cytoid dendritic cells in the peripheral blood after high intense exercise. And we found that right after high intense exercise, PDC and the CD8 positive T cells number in the blood goes decrease, but it recovers about 24 hours after uh, high intense exercise. And then, uh, The next question is, uh, where did they go? They just, just die or they go somewhere else? So to address this question, we check the number of plasma cytoid dendritic cells in other organs like blood, liver, bone marrow, spleen, lymph node, lung, and muscles. And we found that the number of plasma cytoid dendritic cells are increased in the bone marrow, but not other area suggesting that plasma cytodendritic cells in the blood vessels go into the bone marrow during high intense exercise. And then the next question is how plasma cytodendritic cells migrate to bone marrow. And then we checked whole chemokine receptor expression of uh, plasma cytodendritic cells and we found that CXCR4 uh, chemokine receptor expression on PDC goes up after high intense exercise. Not, not others, and, but not others. And CXCR2 is a ligand for uh, CXCR4, and CXCR12, uh, this one, this chemokine is a ligand of CXCR4, is highly expressed in bone marrow. So the next question is whether CXCR4, SD, CXCR12, this chemokine, chemokine receptor signaling is in, really important for the uh, PDC migration in the bone marrow. We use CXCR4 antagonist, and we found that aggravated um, virus infection clinical score and survival rate is rescued by CXCR4 inhibitor. The next question is how CXCR4 is induced on plasma cytoid dendritic cells after high intense exercise. And there are several candidates, glucocorticoid or adrenaline or uh, hypoxic uh, conditions. And to make a long story short, we used a lot of, uh, ex we did a lot of experiments and we finally found that glucocorticoid uh, levels goes up during high intense exercise and glucocorticoid receptor antagonist during high intense exercise rescued the number of PDC. So decreased PDC in the blood can be rescued by uh, glucocorticoid receptor antagonist. And also clinical severe clinical score is rescued and very bad survival rate are also rescued by glucocorticoid receptor antagonist. So to to summarize, during high intense exercise, glucocorticoid is induced and which acts on uh, immune cells to induce CXCR4 expression that lead migrate, that uh, induce the migration of uh, these immune cells from blood vessels into bone marrow. So that's why the number of PDC in the blood is really low. That's why during vagina areas, HSV virus infection, uh, PDC cannot go into, that's why immune response, uh, that's why immune response uh, is really, uh, gets worse. So the conclusion is marathon is bad, and trail running is really bad. So this is my last slide. So I demonstrated here, immune lab interaction, 
may be important for the development of pruritis and also atopic dermatitis. And post-capillary venule blood vessels seems to be the key site for the induction of acquired immunity and exercise-induced glucocorticoid suppress immune functions. And uh, I'd like to also uh, appreciate my colleagues in my department. Thank you very much for uh, attention. Thank you very much, Kenji, for this uh, very nice presentation. And congratulations for the athletic performance. <laughs> Thank you. So the lesson of today, if you want to increase our life, lifespan, we don't have to eat and don't have to make sport. That's the lesson. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Do we have any questions? Yes? Very interesting uh, talk. I'm curious about the uh, effect of uh, this high intense exercise in neurogenesis. As we know, like neurogenesis can be affected by exercise, but maybe there is a level in which it's good, in which it's bad. Do you know anything about the consequence of this high intense exercise for neurogenesis? Um, uh, that's a good question. I haven't addressed this your question, but we what we did is let mice run for three hours two to three hours, that is really high. And that's bad for health. But running for like a 20 or 30 minutes, that's no problem. That's one thing I need to say. <laughs> so appropriate exercise is good, but the too much exercise is bad. But I don't um, address your neurogenic uh, question. Thank you for your talk. Um, and for those things. Um, just two questions. The first one is, um, you mentioned uh, CD8 um, and CD4, so do you know if the ratio between TH1 and TH2 is in balance by, uh, in your condition, that, uh, meaning that so HEA could be increased uh, allergic process or something like that? Ah, during a high end, yeah, yeah, um, um, I didn't check precisely, but almost all CD4, CD, mainly CD8, CD8 T cells number goes down. And uh, what I did is only um, virus infection model, but I agree with you. Maybe um, what happened to like a TH1 or TH2 allergic immunity? That's a very interesting question, but I, I haven't addressed could be with the ratio between the two populations yeah. said or something like that. Yeah. And my second question is so I'm really supportive of gamma delta T cells since a long time and so and I see that you mentioned gamma delta T cells during your presentation. Do you have a, uh, any kind of information of the level of gamma delta T cell in the same condition and so and by the way any kind of wounds regulation after that or something like that? linked to the regulation of extracellular uh, protoglycan or something like that? Mm, that's another very interesting question. But um, uh, the number of gamma delta T cells are very low. And uh, I don't recall exactly. So um, probably gamma delta T cells number were not so much affected, mainly CD8, CD4. PD plasma cytodendritic cells. So maybe um, maybe innate immune response might not be impaired. And uh, I didn't, uh, I don't have your clear answer yet, but I will try to address your question in the future. Uh, yeah, I, I was just wondering uh, regarding the Langeron cells that are supposed to be in the epidermis. I'm not mistaken. How how they behave? <coughs> sorry, how they behave as compared to the uh, dermal dendritic cells? Uh, do, do they exchange some information in between the dermis and the epidermis? Uh, how does it work? Yeah, yeah, that's a very tough question. So, uh, Langerhans cells' origin is uh, macrophages. So, Langerhans cells are close to macrophages, and dermal dendritic cells are close. To, uh, seems to be very different 
lineage. And uh, there are many functional differences between Langerhans cells and dermal dendritic cells. And so uh, Langerhans cells li uh, lo uh, localize at the epidermal area. So usually uh, play important role for big antigen exposure. Uh, for example, protein antigen exposure, especially in, the, in terms of atopic dermatitis. But uh, dermal dendritic cells play important role for small molecule um, um, intrusion, for example, hapten or ion, or maybe intradermal uh, infection. So, and both DC subsets can play uh, TH1, TH2, TH17 regulatory um, axis upon in a context-dependent manner. So they have very wide variety of roles, but mainly the localizations and um, yeah, localize. I think the uh, antigen distribution in the skin is yeah driver yeah. Okay, last question. So thank you very much for this very nice presentation. So I'm very happy to introduce the third invited speaker of this session, Dr. Catherine Moelly from the LBTI laboratory uh, in Lyon. So Catherine is a CNRS research director. Uh, his group is devoted to the understanding of the mechanism of collagen maturation. She's going to present uh, the last result of her group about prote proteolytic maturation of collagen, collagens in the context of wound healing. So I think now it's ready. <laughs> Catherine, I give you the floor for your presentation. Should work. <laughs> so, good afternoon, everybody, and uh, thank you uh, also for, for the kind invitation and also for this very nice opportunity to discuss a bit more about the extracellular matrix uh, component of the skin, uh, which, as you know, plays a, a major role in the physiopathology of this tissue. So today we'll speak mainly about fibrillar collagens, uh, which are the most abundant component in the skin and especially in the dermis, and how their assembly is uh, regulated by extracellular metalloproteinases. So collagen fibrillogenesis is a rather complex uh, multi-step process, uh, but what I would like you to, to, to remember for today is that uh, the collagen precursors, uh, are when they are secreted, they are called the procollagens, and they remain soluble until they are cleaved at their N and C terminus by various procollagen N and C proteinases, which belong to three main families, the HADAMTS, the MEPRINS, and the BTPs. And this proteolytic maturation will lead to a drop in the solubility of the collagen monomers, which can then spontaneously assemble to form uh, fibers. And in one fiber, usually you have several types of collagens. And for example, in skin, collagen one and three are formed in association with uh, uh, collagen five. So among the various uh, proteolytic enzymes which uh, play a role in uh, these maturations, uh, the BTPs uh, play a dominant role uh, because they are also involved in the maturation of small acinrich protoglycans such as decorin, biglycan, osteoglycin, which can bind to the collagen fiber and control their diameter and spacing. And finally, they can also activate uh, two enzymes 
uh, which do not appear very well here, but which are called LOX and LOX-L, and which can initiate the formation of uh, cross-links between collagen monomers to stabilize the collagen network. And depending on the composition of the fibers and also on the nature of the proteolytic maturations, uh, different kind of fibers will be formed with different organizations which are specific for uh, one given tissue. And for example, in skin, we have large bundles of collagen fibers with uh, different local orientations. Uh, so if we focus a bit more on the extracellular metalloproteinases, which are involved in uh, collagen processing, they all belong to the same uh, medzinkin uh, superfamily, which is defined by a consensus zinc binding sequence. Uh, but the last residue in the sequence uh, is different in the different subfamilies. Uh, and also there are small differences in the catalytic domains and uh, bigger differences in the non-catalytic domains, which will control uh, substrate specificity. And for example, if we start with the classical procollagen end proteinases, which were the first to be identified to cleave uh, the end terminus of collagens 1, 2, and 3, they are called ADAMTS2, uh, 3, and 14, and belong to the ADAMTS family. Whereas the classical PCPs are also known as uh, BMP1 toloid-like proteinases, and uh, uh, they will be the, the focus of my uh, presentation today. So they form a small group of four proteinases with BMP1, which is the shortest uh, form in this family. And then there are four longer uh, members, among which mammalian toloid is a splice variant of BMP1. And then there are two additional enzymes called mammalian toloid-like 1 and mammalian toloid-like 2, which are encoded by uh, two additional genes. But uh, this uh, situation is a, a bit more complex than just classical PNPs and PCPs, as always. And uh, recently, it was shown that uh, PNPs, for in some cases, can also behave as PCPs for uh, some procollagens and vice versa. And also, we have recently shown that uh, two additional enzymes called meprin alpha and meprin beta can also cleave the N and C terminus of collagens 1 and 3, and as such, can be considered as PNPs and PCPs. Also, what I would like to stress here is that these enzymes are different from and must not be uh, confused with the more well-known MMPs, or matrix metalloproteinases, which can also cleave collagen, and some of them are called collagenases, such as MMP1, A13, and 14. But this will lead to collagen degradation and not to collagen assembly. And today I will really focus on uh, collagen assembly. So if we summarize the situation uh, in skin, there are two uh, potential types of uh, PC, PNPs, sorry, and three potential, potential types of PCPs, which cleave procollagens at the same sites or at slightly different sites. So how these subtle uh, changes in the cleavage sites can affect fibrillogenesis is not really known at the moment. But what is really clear is that the deficiency in only one of these enzymes is really deleterious for uh, the collagen fibers which are formed. So for example, in the ADAMTS2 knockout mice, uh, the fibrils are, are short and uh, they have these very strange morphologies that you can see on the picture. In the BTP knockout, there are very few fibers and they have this barbed wire appearance. And in the meprin knockout, the, the thickness of the dermis is strongly affected and reduced, and also the fibers are less uh, dense and tightly packed. So very clearly, the three families are very important in skin, and redundancy is only partial. One enzyme cannot compensate for the loss of, the, of another enzyme. However, um, the most severe phenotype is uh, clearly observed in the BTP knockout, and the mice die uh, very early uh, with uh, several uh, defects. Uh, they die around birth or even before, and they have these defects in their skin, but also in the bones, uh, in the heart, in the ventral cavity. 
So a conditional uh, knockout mouse, mouse, uh, mice, mouse model has been uh, developed by the group of Dan Greenspan. And they observed that the mice uh, develop a phenotype which is close to a human disease uh, called osteogenesis imperfecta with a, a short size and a high tendency to, to break their bones. And this is in very good agreement uh, with uh, the, uh, the features of the patients who have uh, mutations in their BMP1 gene and who also uh, suffer from several bone uh, deformities. The last protein I would like to, to mention uh, here is a regulatory protein, which is called PCP1 for procollagen C proteinase and ANSA1. And this protein has the capacity to stimulate in a very efficient way uh, the C-terminal maturation of procollagens 1, 2, and 3 uh, by uh, BTPs. So, for example, here, if you incubate procollagen 3 with BMP1, you have a low level of conversion into as a product which is called PN collagen free, whereas if you incubate both BMP1 and PCP1 together, then you have complete conversion of uh, procollagen free. And the enhancing factor has been estimated to be between 10 and uh, 20, depending on the conditions. So this enhancing effect is also observed for the N-terminal uh, cleavage of uh, collagen 5 uh, by BTPs also uh, with a, a lower efficiency. But in contrast, PCP1 has absolutely no effect on other BTP substrates, such as, for example, uh, osteoglycin that I have mentioned before, or lysyl oxidase, which are also known as, as BTP substrates, but which are not at all affected by uh, PCP1. And for this reason, PCP1 is completely specific of procollagen processing in contrast to, to the BTPs. So in the last years, uh, we spent quite a lot of time trying to understand how this maturation complex works, and especially how the uh, enhancing, how such a, an effective and um, specific mechanism of, enhancing, of enhancement by PCP1 works. And we found that it uh, actually relies on the strong interaction between the N-terminal curb domains in PCP1, CUB1 and CUB2, and the C-terminal domain in the procollagens, which is called the C-propeptide, and which is actually uh, uh, the, the domain which is cleaved during the proteolytic maturation. So, for example, if you compare uh, the activity of full-length PCP1 with the activity of uh, deletion construct containing only CUB1 and CUB2, you have the same level of enhancement of the reaction. And similarly, if you compare full-length procollagen free with uh, a construct where you only have the C-propeptide plus a short tail at the end terminus, uh, this substrate is also cleaved by BMP1 and uh, efficiently enhanced by PCP1, showing that these two domains are really necessary and sufficient for the enhancing uh, activity. Um, so based on this uh, strong interaction between the two domains, uh, we could... Uh, uh, recently uh, solved the, the crystal uh, structure of uh, the complex between the C-propeptide of collagen-3 and the CUB1, CUB2 domains in PCP1. So as you can appreciate, it's a beautiful structure. I hope you see that also. And uh, the C-propeptide looks like uh, what we call a flower with three petals, each corresponding to one chain in the trimer and also a stalk region located here, which is in close proximity with the BMP1 cleavage site, which is located here. And CUB1, CUB2, um, as a minimal enhancer, uh, binds on the stalk region of uh, the C-propeptide with one CUB domain bound on one collagen chain and the other CUB on another chain. And the most interesting part of the structure is better seen here on this view. If you look at the uh, C-propeptide chain, which is shown here in, in pink, you see that uh, the C-terminal extremity is pulled in the direction of the CUB1, CUB2 interface. And this was very interesting because it was a clue that 
uh, in the end, the mechanism of PCP1 activity is to pull on one of the free chain in the trimer to disrupt the compact uh, structure in this part of the molecule and to create space between the free chain to uh, make the cleavage site more accessible uh, for the protease. And this is what has been modeled on this view. So this is a crystal structure, but this is only a model where the catalytic domain of BMP1 has been positioned on the pool chain of the procollagen in close proximity with the PCP1 uh, protein. And I think there is a zoom, yes. Uh, so this is our current view of the mechanism of action of the maturation complex, and we are still working to, to position the non-catalytic domains of PMP1, which are, uh, we, for which we don't really know uh, their role and where they are located. So after this uh, rather long introduction, uh, what is the role and expression of these proteins uh, in skin homeostasis and in skin wound healing? So to look at this, we use a rather classical uh, uh, skin wound healing model in mice, uh, where full thickness wounds were created in the, uh, in the back skin of the mice. And what we observed was that the most relevant BTP protease in this uh, model was BMP1, which is uh, the most highly expressed uh, protease. And you see that the expression peaks around day seven. Uh, which corresponds to uh, the proliferative or granulation phase of uh, wound healing. So this is at the RNA level, but we have similar pictures uh, at the protein level using immunofluorescence. So similarly for PCP1, we have the same uh, kinetics of expression with a peak around day uh, seven and a tenfold increase in the uh, mRNA level. Uh, which is uh, also observed at the protein level, bo both by Western blood and uh, immunofluorescence. So then we looked at the expression of these proteins in uh, individual skin cells, and we analyzed human keratinocytes, human fibroblasts, and also um, a monocyte cell line, the THP1 cells, which can be differentiated into macrophages. And we observed that uh, BMP1 is expressed in all these cells, uh, including the keratinocytes, fibroblasts, and also the macrophages, regardless of the M1 or M2 polarization state. But in contrast, PCP1 is only found in fibroblasts. There is absolutely no expression in keratinocytes, nor in macrophages. And this probably makes sense because uh, PCP1, as we have seen, is uh, completely specific of procollagen processing, and procollagen is a typical fibroblast-derived protein. So the, the group who developed the, um, the BTP conditional knockout uh, mouse model also studied skin, and they observed that skin homeostasis was strongly impaired with a, a very a strong reduction in the thickness of the dermis. And again, this is rather logical because these mice cannot assemble collagen anymore and they cannot renew their, their collagen matrix. And we know that collagens are very abundant in the skin dermis. And this is of course exacerbated after wounding where there is almost no possibility for the reconstitution of the, of the dermis. Uh, and this leads to a, a very severe delay in wound closure. Also, people now start to look at uh, skin scarring, and uh, in collaboration with the group of uh, Alexander Nistrom and Lena bruckner tudermann in Freiburg, we had access to uh, the skin of RDEB patients. So RDEB is recessive dystrophic epidermolysis bullosa, and it is a skin blistering uh, disease, which leads to a progressive uh, fibrosis in the dermis. And uh, we observed that uh, BMP1 is strongly upregulated in, uh, in the fibrotic skin of these patients. Also, there was an interesting study uh, uh, some years ago by uh, Pfizer, uh, where they used uh, a BMP1 inhibitor in a rabbit ear scarring model. And they observed that uh, the treatment with this inhibitor can uh, slightly but significantly reduce the height of uh, the scar 
um, as estimated by the SCAR elevation index. And now there are a number of reports showing that uh, both BMP1 and PCP1 are upregulated in hypertrophic scars. Uh, for example, here in fibroblast originating from hypertrophic scars, we have a high uh, PCP1 expression. So in the last uh, minutes of my presentation, I would like to uh, describe another uh, function of uh, the BTPs, which is also more or less directly connected to collagen synthesis and collagen assembly. So just to give you of an idea of the methodology we use to uh, find new activities and new functions for these uh, extracellular metalloproteinases, we use uh, quantitative proteomics and uh, we analyze uh, the condition medium of uh, various uh, cell types, including skin fibroblasts, for example, and we always have a condition where the protease is absent or inactivated and a condition with active protease. And we use several types of uh, proteomics approach, but especially this one, which is called TAILS, for terminal amine isotopic labeling of substrates, and uh, which is a really uh, protease-specific approach, which allows us to identify in a very specific manner the N-terminal peptides in proteins, and uh, this allows us to reveal proteolytic fragments. It gives us the information about what proteins are cleaved, where they are cleaved, and to what extent. So using this approach, we uh, could identify something like 80 uh, different new or already known uh, substrates for the BMP1 uh, protease. And what attracted our attention in this uh, list is that several candidates are actually related to the TGF-beta pathway. And as you probably know, TGF-beta is uh, very important for wound healing. It is uh, considered to be an anti-inflammatory cytokine, which can regulate the switch between the inflammatory uh, phase and the proliferative phase. It can also induce the differentiation of fibroblasts into my fibroblasts. So we found several TGA-beta co-receptors, uh, several regulators, and several target genes, including collagens 1 and 3, fibronectin, CR61, and so on. So today I would like to uh, describe a bit more uh, the cleavage of thrombospondin 1, which is a very important TGF-beta uh, regulator. So TGF-beta uh, activation is a also a complex process. Uh, so usually TGF-beta is secreted in the latent form where it remains bonds to its propeptide, which is called LAP, and forms a latent complex, which is targeted for storage in the extracellular matrix through an interaction with a protein called LTBP. And TSP1, or thrombospondin 1, is a large homotrimeric extracellular matrix protein which can interact with the latent complex and disrupt the internal interactions between TGF-beta and its propeptide, and this leads to the release of active TGF-beta, which can then uh, induce signaling uh, through its receptors, so either the canonical SMAT pathway or non-canonical pathways. So if we treat cells with thrombospondin 1, uh, we observed uh, an increase in the phosphorylation of SMAT2, which reveals ITGF-beta activity. And what was very interesting for us is first that we could confirm that BM uh, TSP1 was a direct BMP1 substrate, and we can uh, clearly see a proteolytic fragment, which is uh, um, produced here. And also that the phosphorylation of SMAT2 is uh, strongly increased uh, in the presence of cleaved thrombospondin as compared to intact uh, thrombospondin, suggesting that the TGF-beta activation pathway is more efficient by, when uh, with cleaved TSP1 than with intact TSP1. So how do we explain this? Uh, so we identified the TSP1 cleavage site and found it to be located just before the TGF-beta binding site on thrombospondin 1. And what we think is that maybe this cleavage leads to a, a cleavage site which is more accessible uh, because we start with a probably relatively compact trimeric structure 
And uh, this uh, cleavage leads to uh, monomeric uh, C-terminal fragments. So another consequence of this, uh, what I call superactivation um, of TGA beta by TSP1, is that uh, it induces differentiation of myofibroblast as revealed, uh, of, of fibroblast into myofibroblast, sorry, as revealed by the alpha smooth muscle actin uh, marker. And again, cleave TSP1 is more efficient to induce uh, uh, myofibroblast differentiation than intact TSP1. So to summarize, TSP1 activates TGF beta, which can then induce myofibroblast differentiation. And if BMT1 cleaves TSP1, this makes this myofibroblast differentiation cascade more efficient. And uh, this is only one of the mechanisms, as you can see, uh, by which uh, BMT1 regulates TGF beta activity and bioavailability. Uh, there are several other mechanisms. I'm not going to describe all of them. But what we uh, should bear in mind here is that TGF beta will then induce collagen uh, synthesis and extracellular matrix protein uh, expression, but also it will uh, increase the, the expression of BMP1 itself. So this leads to a positive uh, feedback mechanism, um, which can be very important and interesting to boost and to promote wound healing, but which can also probably have very deleterious consequences uh, for skin scarring and uh, fibrosis. So the way I like to conclude is to say that BMP1 is a proteolytic hub which can synchronize uh, matrix assembly with growth factor signaling. And uh, today we have discussed collagen and TGF beta, but there are several other processes which are controlled by this protease. And they will all lead to, uh, uh, to promote morphogenesis and tissue repair but they can also drive uh, scarring and fibrosis. So uh, if we think in terms of therapeutic approaches, uh, I don't really think that the BTPs could be a very interesting targets because they have so many different activities and I think that their inhibition would trigger uh, some unwanted effects. So what we are doing now is to evaluate the therapeutic potential of PCP1, which could be a more promising uh, target because it's uh, much more specific of uh, procollagen processing and collagen assembly. So with this, I would like to thank uh, the people in my group and especially Agnès Tessier, who has done most of the skin work. She was also selected for the young researcher session but couldn't come due to medical reasons. Of course, she was very disappointed, but she says good luck to all uh, remaining uh, <laughs> uh, nominated young researchers. And I would also like to uh, acknowledge the work of Cyril Anastasi, who worked on the regulation of TGF beta uh, activation, and a very nice collaboration with Alexander Nistrom and Lena Bruckner Tudorman in Freiburg. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Catherine. We have questions about this presentation. Yes, uh, Cédric. Uh, it's a very naive question. I was wondering whether the, the, the cells that are secreting the, the pro-TGF that associate with the ECM and the cells <coughs> that would uh, secrete also the, the BMPs are exactly the same cell. Is it? Uh, is there a kind of regulation, cells that secrete some factor, other cells that will uh, secrete the, the one that will process and... Uh, yeah, yeah, possibly, yes. Uh, for example, uh, uh, it has been described that TGF beta can easily go from the dermal, dermal compartment to the epidermis, and uh, this is actually uh, uh, one of the pathways by which uh, uh, inflammation actually drives uh, wound healing. Uh, so, of course, it's, it doesn't have to be the same cells uh, which produce all the components to uh, activate TGF beta or process collagens and so on. And maybe just related to that, so if you, if you want to, 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 to secrete uh, towards long distance this TGF, this pro-TGF from dermis to epidermis, is it through just uh, soluble secretion? Because uh, 
I guess that once it's outside, it should associate with the ECM very easily. So yes, it, it can, but uh, if you think in terms of wound dealing, usually the basement membrane is disrupted, so this barrier at least is abolished. Uh, so this is one of the reasons we think that it can actually go from one compartment to the other. And also there are some examples that TGF-beta regulates melanocyte uh, biology and uh, uh, it can also probably uh, go from one cell to another. So how diffusion will compete with so many interactions in the matrix is difficult to anticipate. Um, but I'm doing a lot of protein-protein interaction studies and TGA-beta interacts with a lot of things, uh, for sure. But I guess there are ways where it can uh, still diffuse in the tissue and reach its targets, for sure. And you need very, very low le level of TGA-beta to have a significant effect, so. Ms. Florence. Yes, I would like to know whether you have a look at the PNP expression because you said that you, have, you will have a loop uh, with the expression of EMP1 and the collagen, but to have full um, you processed mean in, collagen. In the, in the one dealing assays? Yes, yeah. yes. Uh, not really because we thought that our collaborator, Alain Kolic, would do that. Uh, but apparently he, he has some trouble to work with the head MTS2 knockout and could not really establish the one dealing model uh, for the moment. Um, but what is known is that LMTS2 is probably the, the most prominent uh, PNP in the skin. Also, we started to look at meprin expression in the skin because, you know, we have this work showing that the meprins can also cleave the N terminus of collagens 1 and, and 3. But it seems that in basal normal condition, even in wound dealing, uh, meprin expression is very low and is probably not so relevant uh, PNP uh, uh, to trigger um, collagen assembly. It's more like in fibrotic uh, conditions, like in keloids, we have increased, uh, increased meprin expression, for example. And in this case, then meprins can uh, become more relevant. And is it a TGF beta target gene? Are they uh, meprins? You mean? Yeah, all the PNP. Um. Uh, for LMTS2, I must say I don't know. Um, meprins. Um, I'm almost sure they are not target genes. But it's really strange because PCP1, for example, is not a target gene of TGF beta, whereas the BTPs are. So you know, sometimes you must be careful in. <laughs> making extrapolations. Okay, thank you. I have a question about the proteomic search for a new substrate of uh, PCP1. Uh, I think you use um, uh, fibroblasts from cornea and from uh, skin. So uh, did you identify the same substrate from the two types of fibroblasts? I would say yes, more or less. <laughs> uh, of course, there are some differences. But you know, um, with proteomics, you always uh, lose a lot of things. So I guess it's more a technical problem than a real difference. Perhaps I miss it. Uh, so sorry if yes. Uh, I was wondering if there is any change in expression or act activity of the enzymes uh, during aging. Have you compared, for example? This is, of course, a very good question, and this has not been looked at at all, <laughs> at least uh, in a targeted point of view. Maybe there are some uh, transcriptomic analyses where, by chance, BMP1 is up or down regulated, but I'm not aware of them. I haven't looked in details. Um, but in my group, at least, we haven't looked at this, and I think there are two groups in the world working on these proteins. So <laughs> I'm pretty sure this has not been clearly published and established. Uh, but, of course, this is something which could be looked at in detail. No. It's okay, no more questions. So, last one, Frédéric. Thank you for your uh, clear presentation. I have a question on uh, uh, recessive dystrophic uh, epidermolysis bullosa. You mentioned that uh, uh, you have a fibrotic dermis, which is not very obvious for me as a physician. Yes, so the, the, main, um, the main feature of, uh, of epidermolysis bullosa, of course, is a defect in the, in the attachment of the epidermis on the dermis. 
And the consequence of this is a, a chronic inf inflammation, which over time would lead to fibrosis. And it's a very, very severe fibrosis, which is triggered by uh, any type of wound, uh, which can occur in this patient. And we must bear in mind that, of course, the skin is very fragile, so they are very much susceptible to wounds. And their wounds uh, never heal. So with time, it will lead to uh, chronic fibrosis, even in the dermis, not only. Yes, but uh, uh, at least clinically, it's not obvious. And uh, we know that uh, matrix is uh, different and uh, is uh, susceptible to induce uh, uh, epidermoid uh, uh, carcinoma. Mm -hmm. It's demonstrated. But I, I, I mean, uh, for a physician, it's not fibrotic like uh, scleroderma. No, there are but some. I see uh, the picture of histology, and it seems uh, fibrotic. But. I think fibrosis will be different depending on the sites you are looking at, and uh, sites which are more subjected to wounds will be more highly affected than our sites, for sure. And the the features of fibrosis are not maybe the same ones as you would find in keloids or hypertrophic scar. Uh, for example, I have not shown the picture, but for PCP1, which is uh, really considered as a fibrosis marker, uh, even in uh, fibrosis of other organs like heart or kidney or whatever, uh, its expression is downregulated in uh, RGEB. So you don't have all the markers you would expect. So it's probably a uh, a different type of fibrosis which is developed here, but still collagen is abundant and uh, you have fusion of the digits for the most affected patients. And uh, there are features of fibrosis, but maybe it's not a typical one. And this is something we are going to study now because we just get funding for to do that. <laughs> and do you think it's related only to uh, abnormality of collagen 7 or it's an indirect effect? I think it's an indirect effect for sure. It's really due to inflammation and repeated wounds. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much for all the speakers of this session and the very interesting scientific discussion. So well, now we have the coffee break and poster viewing. So you have to take time to, to watch the, the posters. I think you will have to vote for the best poster. I think it is the, the audience which is involved in the selection of the best poster. So, okay. We have 30 minutes for poster and coffee break. Thank you.